Today I'd like to tell you a story about musical Easter eggs, a slightly damaged brain, and the incredible power of the unexpected and surprising in storytelling and also in our personal lives. For the past 25 years or so, I've been lucky enough to write music for film and television. My works have been heard by millions of people all around the world. But if five years ago I told you that probably the music I'm best known for now was written for a show that was never shown on a traditional TV broadcast or in a movie theater, I, of course, would have said you're out of your minds, but that's exactly what happened with the success of our show, House of Cards, on Netflix. Now, Netflix and shows like it really changed the way that we consume media as viewers. It also changed the way that we tell stories. I think my favorite example of this is some of the students I talked to today who said they haven't even watched our new season because they're afraid it'll affect their grades. Well, why is that? Because really, a season of House of Cards really isn't 13 episodes. It's more like a 13-hour movie. And that's exciting because it's really changed the, the way we can tell the stories, especially in these long-form stories. In, in an age where we feel like we live in such an uh, a era of a short attention span, you know, a season of House of Cards is like three Wagner operas. That's pretty impressive that we will invest that much time in something, right? It also got me thinking of this other question that I've often wondered about, which is, what exactly is this relationship between the artist, the creator, and the audience? What is this loop and what does it mean exactly? You know, our traditional model was much like this picture, a person on a stage, much like I am today, addressing a crowd or a painting hanging in a gallery, or a book maybe written by an author living a thousand miles away or even dead already. You know, and, and it's very much a one-way conversation, but I've always had this suspicion and this feeling that the relationship between an artist and, the, and their audience is really a much more circular and subtle one than that. Now, I discovered these wonderful pieces I, by I, artist Jeffrey Koons on that great bastion of intellectual ideas, the Stephen Colbert show a few years ago, and uh, a few months ago, I should say, and I just love these. These are, uh, he, what he does is he creates these beautiful recreations of iconic paintings and sculptures, and in front of them, he puts this three-dimensional orb, he kind of calls it a gazing ball, and the whole idea is that not only do you see the painting, but you see your reflection. And I, I loved hearing that when people see these in a gallery, often people spend as much time looking into the reflection and the ball as they actually do looking at the paintings, which is fine, because it's fascinating. And it's really a great visual metaphor for really what is happening when we encounter art. It's simply not a static or a one-way conversation, but there's this incredible dialogue that's happening. The viewer is watching it. And it really answers another existential question I've often wondered is, when is a piece of art actually finished? Is it done when the painter is done painting it or when I'm done composing a song? And I've really come to the conclusion that the answer to that question is never. That art is constantly being created and more in fact being recreated when you and I have a dialogue with it, when we have an experience with it, and we actually create a narrative in viewing this. There's a story that happens that's not just on the canvas, it's actually happening in our minds as we form an interpretation. And that interpretation, that thing that we take away, is simply a living and breathing thing. It's part of what makes the humanity such a beautiful thing. Now, I had my own personal sort of gazing ball moment about four years ago when our show premiered on Netflix. I started hearing from fans and friends of the show, but one observation took me completely by surprise, and it was this little moment in our main title sequence where a train goes under a bridge. Let me just show that to you real quickly here. Okay, that was it, you know? It was, it was literally like two or three seconds. I mean, you'd blink, if you'd blinked, you'd miss it. Here it is again. Okay, so what was happening? Well, first of all, this was hilarious to me because I can tell you without question, I did not plan for this to happen at all. The actual synchronization of that little musical moment with the train was kind of serendipitous. The structure had already been designed before. But probably more important, I never thought that people would take, pay that much attention to that little moment in the music. It's kind of in between two of the main phrases of the melody. So something else happened which fascinates me, and I love it because it gives me a way to talk to you about what I do and peek under the hood a little bit. Really what happened is the audiences, the viewers, actually created and found their own little musical Easter egg in the theme. And what happened was, 
by repetition, an attachment was formed and a story was created. A story that I hadn't even really consciously tried, tried to create, but this power of the combination of the image and the sound created a powerful memory. And of course, you can see in the dictionary, we have now two definitions of Easter egg. I really love the first one because emotionally, it's kind of what I'm talking about. It's that joy of discovery. But the second one, of course, we, is a modern idea coming from computer code and maybe now main title theme music. But, but it really points to something that I think has been with us ever since the dawn of, of civilization. Is this our desire to find a story and to find something. Now, this is fun because music is such an abstract language. How could we possibly find something and create meaning out of such an abstract and short little musical phrase? And I think there's a few answers we can look at which are sort of fun to talk about. You know, one of the things that I love is surprises. I love it in music, I love musical surprises, and I use it a lot in my work as a, as a film composer, because really surprise is incredibly useful, right? A joke isn't funny if you know the punchline's coming. A dramatic surprise or a scare doesn't really work if you see it coming around. It's that notion of, being, of the interruption of the normal that really perks us up. And in House of Cards, there's a very simple juxtaposition of, of a musical idea that I use, and it's basically breaking a musical rule. We have these two modes, major and minor, and one of the first things you learn as a composer or musician is to stay in your proper key. But one of the things I did in the, in the House of Cards theme was actually to combine those two things at the same time, and here's what that little moment sounds like. Okay, so do you hear that? It creates this clash, and because of that clash, it does a few things. It surprises you, but it also perks your brain up. I think in the terms of our show, it's a good sort of storytelling device to saying, wow, this is sort of grand, but there's probably some evil, really weird stuff going on, right? It's sort of, sort of subversive in a way. We can also create interruption and surprise and drama with timbre, and in this case, we have an electric guitar. Okay. Now, aside from sounding pretty cool, right? Uh, it's also interruptive. We've, we haven't really heard that sound. We've heard trumpet and drums and strings and electric bass, but that's new information. And even though it's very short and even not even that loud, our ears and our brains have the ama uh, this amazing ability to catalog music in a very sophistic sophisticated way and actually form a memory. Dan Levitan in his book, This Is Your Brain on Music, has talked about this a lot in the way you can actually hear just a couple seconds of a favorite song of yours, not enough to really hear a melody or any of the structure, but you'll recognize it. And the only way that can happen is your ear has actually cataloged that complicated timbre, those collection of sounds that are happening at the same time. Now, there's a third thing going on here, too, in the music, which is the bass line. All of you that know the music and know the show know that bass line, right? It's a very simple idea. It's only two notes, and it plays this phrase all the way through the piece. Now, the thing that makes it unusual at this particular moment is that the bass line never changes. There's a dramatic reason for this that I can say now, I don't think I was thinking about when I wrote it, but I think in retrospect, it feels to me very much like the personality of Frank Underwood. He's a guy who's just a steamroller. He doesn't care about what anybody else is doing. He's just going to force his will, right? But on musical terms, that creates an interesting juxtaposition because on top of that bass line, the chords do change. So by the time the chords change and the train goes under the bridge, the bass is actually playing the wrong notes, and it sounds like this. That's just weird, and I love it. I love the weirdness of it. And what it does is it creates in our brains this little musical jigsaw puzzle that we have to, what it does is it sort of, it invites you to answer a riddle. Now, it's kind of an unanswerable riddle, but that doesn't matter because part of what we do, what's fascinating about cinema and film, is that our brains are always constantly trying to rationalize and sort out and make some sort of structure. So what happened? Well, the listener confronted with this musical juxtaposition and visual perfectly synchronized, they created a story. I think the stories are probably way different. In fact, I'd like everybody to email me and tell me what it means because I'd like to know, right? But this really is fascinating to me. It's the power of the imagination. And even Steven Spielberg had to use this back in 1975 when he made his film Jaws. Now in Jaws, this was a classic monster movie and Great White Shark was gonna be a stand-in for Godzilla or King Kong, right? He wanted to build a mechanical shark to film underwater which was gonna terrify his audience. But remember, this was 1975 and even though one of the best special effects artists in Hollywood built the shark, it didn't work. This shark was a disaster. The salt water got into the electrical motors. It just sank to the bottom of the ocean. 
Spielberg got back to Los Angeles to cut his film together, really worried that he made a flop, okay? So what did he do? He had to improvise a new solution. And he went back to the gazing ball. He said, well, maybe if I don't have the shark, maybe I can help create the idea of the shark. In fact, that might even be scarier than seeing the shark. Now, those of you that know film know that this is something that other filmmakers have done, especially Alfred Hitchcock, most, most uh, expertly in Psycho, right? So I can tell you, being a kid, Jaws premiered in 1975, and I can still remember being a young boy, sitting in the audience, seeing those churning shots of the ocean, and then enter music. John Williams' iconic and terrifying and beautifully orchestrated, thrilling score. I can tell you that image of the shark that I created in my own mind, in my own imagination, was probably 10 times more terrifying than anything I could have seen. I spent a lot of time looking at actors, and a lot of times, what they don't say is much more fascinating than what they do say. It's the little cues of, of uh, facial expression and body language and enter music, which also tickles our brain in a much more subjective level, which is so fun and so surprising. Now, I love surprises and I love the unexpected. My gateway drug into being a composer was actually playing jazz and improvising. And I love the way in playing jazz, you can sometimes paint yourself into a little corner and see if you can get out of it. But I found, in my personal life, painting into a much different corner. In 2007, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Now, I was 44 years old at the time, otherwise a perfectly happy person and healthy. But it became very clear to me that the only choice we would have with this, since it's, a, as of now, an incurable disease, was figure out how we're going to respond to it. And part of that response, for me, involved creating a new narrative. Well, what could I do? This book came out the same year I was diagnosed, The Brain That Changed Itself, and I devoured this thing. It was all about the science of brain plasticity and how our old model of the brain, where a child's uh, cognitive life is sort of wired up by about five or six and the brain never changes over the whole life, we now know that that's all fa false. The body is actually, the brain is plastic. It's possible to rewire and make new connections all through your life. So this is also why stroke patients or patients of traumatic brain injury can also find recovery after hard work. Well, what's happening? Well, the brain is actually rewiring itself. Well, that was great news to me because in looking at my brain scans, I had about 20 of the so, and I still have about 20 of the classic MS lesions that, that, are, that are little areas of damage in the brain. Now, also in looking at my scans, we found that most of these lesions were in a very specific area of the brain called the corpus callosum. This picture shows, sort of in a crude way, but in a very direct way, really what it does is it's sort of a central station. It facilitates the communication between the left brain and the right brain. And for you, those of you that know how music works and how many areas of the brain it stimulates, this is actually an area of the brain that's more developed and larger in people that have, guess what, studied music their whole lives. <laughs> well, that was me, right? So armed with this information on plasticity, the location of a lot of my lesions, I had the makings of a new narrative, it was a story I was going to tell myself, and it was simply this. By continuing to do what I love, by writing music every day, not only was I going to stay active and, and practice my art, but this was going to be the canvas upon which I could also be painting. I would be painting on my brain, I would be strengthening these pathways, and making sure that I'm building the neural networks that can work around these damaged areas and, and promote health in my own, in my own life. The stories we tell ourselves are incredibly important, and this is just the story that I tell myself. But I also want to share you with this, this fact, that also we, are, we have really learned through a lot of measurable studies that the stories we tell ourselves as patients, as people, are incredibly important, not only to our mental health, but also to our physical health. There are actually measurable results from these narratives, and that was inc very encouraging to me. Of course, there are many obstacles, many diseases, which simply a personal narrative does not solve, and I'm not trying to suggest that. But these are really powerful things. Now, our show premiered in 2013, and I was very surprised it became a huge hit. And I was also surprised that people liked it so much because of the type of story we were telling. A Machiavellian politician and his wife, not very nice people who are ready to throw anybody under the bus to get what they want or murder people, right? And why is this? Why do we enjoy these kind of stories? Well, I think on one level, the fiction is fun, right? We enjoy the ride. But I think on another very important level, we like these stories. We like our, the, the, the stories that are well told, well told. They contain in them all the sort of brokenness and seeds of the real world in a way that we can sort of vicariously live through them. And actually, they serve as little practice fields where we practice our own gift for narrative and forming our own strategies and take that on into our real life. 
I love music, and I love repetition, and there's one question that sort of nagged me about this talk, and it was, if surprise is so important, why is it that we can listen to the same piece of music we love over and over and over again? Even more than we might watch a movie three or four times or read a book six or seven times, we will do that with music. And it's simply this, that music is an incredible discipline. It's probably the oldest cultural phenomenon we have as a species. And it, it's, it's, it's wired into our brains in very specific ways. It stimulates the cognitive, it stimulates the language centers, it stimulates the visual a lot. A lot of what we're doing when we're listening to music is actually trying to con construct a sort of visual map of what the sounds are. But it also stimulates some very important areas of our brain, the ones that feel emotions and, and pain and pleasure, and it also stimulates a very important part of our memory, but the part of our memory that catalogs feelings. This is the reason repetition is so important, because by doing this, we're actually creating our own little emotional Easter eggs. All this experience we have with art, if you know if you've heard a song from your childhood that meant a lot to you, you can have all these feelings come back. This is also why for patients with Alzheimer's or advanced dementia, music can be one of the last art forms that unlocks the, the soul and the spirit of those people. And it's really beautiful. If you've never seen this documentary, Alive Inside, that's a great example of the power of music to awaken the memory in people. So in conclusion, I want to go back to this gazing ball, and I want to turn it back to you and think about this power of story. Not only the power of story that, that I have, but the power of story that's inside you. You know, we live in an incredible world, okay? Filmmakers never have to worry about their mechanical sharks working because we can create anything out of our imaginations through CGI and all these things. We can do the same thing with music and digital sound. It's almost like everything's at our fingertips and we're constantly bombarded by this imagery. But I want to leave you with this idea, and it's simply this. That the most important stories and the most important dialogue we have with the humanities, with painting, with art, with sculpture and dance, cinema, books, is not simply the stories that are spoon-fed to us, but the stories that we actively engage with, the stories that we help create through our own imagination, through the power of the unexpected and the mysteries of hidden messages. Thank you very much.